for barbecue if there is any and chop it up and put it on top of some cheese and chips and put it in the microwave and you got yourself some barbecue nachos you know kind of impromptu and that was kind of how i got started practicing and getting in the kitchen and the more i got in the kitchen at home uh the better i got with cooking and then now it's to the point where i think um I, I like to refer to myself as an untrained culinarian uh, in that regard. I'm not quite yet a chef, but... Uh, <laughs> the intersection of good drinks, good music, and good times. This is Hops and Spirits Bar Conversations. Whether it was Star Wars Day, Cinco de Mayo, the Kentucky Derby, maybe graduation was going on. It seemed like there were plenty of celebrations to be had. And we got a good one for you this week uh, to help in those maybe that recovery from all of those celebrations. We talk with Cowboy Troy for our conversation. It's a fun one. And we dive into more than just music as he's got a lot going on. But before that, our tasting notes is with Kevin Patterson as we head to the hoppy side of things and hear what's uh, going on in the beer world. What trends is he seeing? It's a fun one. That's next. Enjoy. Did you know Hops and Spirits is more than just this podcast? Check out hopspirits.com for our latest episode release, past episodes, interviews with interesting folks in the alcohol industry, and so much more. Just go to hopspirits.com. Feel free to wait until this podcast is done. Back again here on Tasting Notes with Kevin Patterson. He's a Cicero National Beer Judge. He's also the manager of the Beer Trap Craft Beer Store and Bar in Lexington, Kentucky. That almost always trips me up. <laughs> Welcome back, Kevin. <laughs> it's a lot. You could just open it by saying what it is. Here's Kevin. He's your he's Lexington's most professional drunk. And 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 second place bartender, is that right? <laughs> I think second most favorite bartender in Lexington. So close. So close. Oh, but you know, like I said, you, you, you have a cool job there. You're, you're the manager of the beer trap craft beer store, store and bar. And I, I always enjoy going there. I always enjoy sitting down and talking to you, but you know, while people think bar, but there's also a store aspect to it. And I'm curious, um, to see what you're seeing these days because you are literally up close to it and personal with it because you, you live and breathe it every day there at the, at the beer trap. So what are you seeing from folks buying these days? Have trends changed any? Because I know we've talked how things can be cyclical and, and kind of come back around. Is that still the case or, or what, what's going on these days? Yeah, things are changing pretty pretty rapidly right now. And, you know, before I get into the nuts and bolts of that, um, I'm still kind of pissed off that my high school career counselor thought I could be an accountant. I'm not an accountant. <laughs> I'm a beer seller. And she didn't tell me that when I was 17 years old. She should have known. But uh, alas, you know, here I am, and I found my way eventually to the beer trust. I'm happy to be there. But, you know, trends are always changing, and sometimes it has to do with the flavors that beer palate shifts, but sometimes it has to do with other things. And right now, a big thing that we're faced with is economic challenges. One of the things that we're starting to see a little bit is whenever money gets tight, people start looking for what we used to call affordable luxuries. And so as the bourbon industry has really caught fire and, you know, and they've had to raise prices, uh, the wine industry has a lot of these industries has really had to really, really shoot up in price a little bit. A lot of that has to do with packaging materials, particularly you know, aluminum and glass, um, but also gas prices and how the, all these beverages are shipped is starting to play a major role in, in, in the prices increasing. So the palate is developing a little bit more toward uh, cost effective beers. And that's what we're seeing as well. And so as people kind of say, well, maybe I don't buy any of that high-end uh, beverages out there, a high-end cocktail, uh, maybe beer, you know, can, can, can help me out a little bit. Because the prices of our products have also gone up, just not at the same clip, but has some other products. So beer has always been the common man's beverage, meaning that there's a beverage out there for uh, pretty much any income. You know, there's not a product in our store that outprices anyone on a middle income budget. And so along with that, brewers are sort of looking at things a little different way, too. It's like, well, how can we create beers that are, you know, equally in demand as our full flavor, full bodied stuff? But how can we charge less for them? So that means they have to change the raw ingredients, maybe a touch, uh, simplify the grain bill, simplify their hop bill and develop styles that maybe aren't as intense. They can still keep that price point per six pack somewhere around 10 or 11 dollars. It used to be brewers did not want to go above that $10 mark because psychologically that meant a lot to buyers. And they did not want to pay more than $10 for a six-pack. So brewers did a lot of other things. Well, let's not change the price, but maybe we'll go to four packs, 16-ounce cans, where we're giving people a similar ounce uh, purchase, but you know it's packaged differently, so they're not spending so much on the packaging. 
So this manifested in some of the more simplified um, IPAs. Uh, for the first time in a couple of years, we're seeing the smash IPAs, the single malt and single hop, uh, because that's just one hop and that's just one grain. We can put a beer out that's very affordable. Uh, another thing they're doing is like, you know what, if we use less raw materials too, we can we can do better. So that's when you're seeing the rise of uh, lagers, pilsners, and brewers there are, are choosing very traditional German roots whenever it comes to the basics of lager making, making these pilsners. Uh, however, they're choosing for some domestic hops that they can get in the beer uh, fresher and they don't have to spend so much on them uh, because they're made here in America. And so they're using these hybrid kind of hop um, uh, lager making uh, ingredients and techniques splicing together a beer that's very easy to drink. And most people who have ventured out of the Bud Light and said, okay, I can accept the Heineken or I can accept the Stella or accept the Hofbrau. Now they can accept some of these other beers like Pep Talk from Bearded Iris, Buena Vesa by Stone, um, Dorothy by Toppling Goliath. And so we've seen a big uptick in those cells uh, as spring has kind of rolled around too and people are pinching the pennies a bit more. Yeah, I was going to say, it's been pretty interesting to see so many folks going that logger route you know they've kind of gone like as one of their main distributed beers i mean I, I, for especially around here a lot of folks kind of a few had that but a lot a lot of them are starting to really you know get into that and even not just a small six pack but looking at 15 packs and and things like that yeah founders has really gone that route uh the sour ales you can really you know lighten a sour beer up and still find fans with beer drinkers so founders have done that with number one they're all day series uh, beers and also their um, uh, the Green Zebra series uh, has recently come out too. So you are seeing that lightness across the board kind of panning out. As long as they can keep the beer quality, as long as they can keep it refreshing, crisp, clean, error free, and buyers don't feel like that they have to give up on flavor to get an acceptable product. So I think that's playing a lot. And let's face it, people are still coming in over the bolder stuff. It's just like instead of coming in, I don't need nine pastry stouts today. Maybe I only need two pastry stouts. Then after two pastry stouts, you know, you know what? My palate is on fire. I am done. I am wrecked. I need to go with something very, very simple. And so they're like, all right, give me the cheap lager. I'm fine with that. Well, and uh, another thing I'm always curious about is, you know, sometimes these trends you kind of see because you start to see folks release things and, and so forth. But is there anything that's unexpectedly kind of happened that you're like, huh, never thought in a million years that that, that, that would be walking out of, out of the shelves here? Um, more so than anything, it's the pastry styles. It, you know, you got flavors of carrot cake styles and, you know, a la mode styles and whenever you drink these things, or I'm sorry, you know, the, you have these beers and, and, you know, it's just like, oh my gosh, we're, we're basically, I mean, is there 10,000 calories in this can? There has to be 10,000 calories. So I find myself whenever I talk about these beers, I'll say, look, this thing is absolutely delicious. But if you're going to open this can, make sure that you have a mid-sized European village there to help share it with. Because you can't possibly drink one of these on your own. Every time somebody orders two, I'm like, I can give you another one. But I have to give you a, a, a shot in between. I have you legally administer an insulin shot in between doses. And, you know, it's my Check way out Hop Spirits on social media. And they really Hop Spirits, that sweet all tooth one personality. word, and on Instagram, it. TikTok, one of the Facebook, and Twitter. I didn't think you can I'd also find Hop Spirits on YouTube and at HopSpirits.com. And even though they're not gluten-free beers necessarily, they're almost a seltzer-based product. But they call them an ale just because the definition of it allows them to do that and still sell them through the natural beer, beer distribution process. But some of these are like imperial seltzers with just a ton of lactose and vanilla and these other flavors, these extracts and, you know, just a ton of other kind of flavors and textures that make them very robust, very rich and very rounded. They're very much cocktails just made out of uh, seltzer ingredients and, you know, disguised as ale. But that's kind of where the demand is going. We're going to see, I think, more fusion of these kind of hybrid drinks coming about. And, you know, I, I never thought that I would, you know, have to, you know, sell something like, okay, this is a brownie beer. Do you want the brownie beer? <laughs> And so, you know, but people like them, people enjoy them. But for me, it, oftentimes, it's like, I'll take three or four sips of this thing. And I'm like, you know what? You know, I've got to donate the rest of this to the, to the drain because it just, it's just palate fatigue comes on so quickly for me. But I'm surprised how many people don't experience that. They just drink the whole thing and they'll ask for another. <laughs> so some, uh, I guess, just have the willpower to, to push through. I know I, I enjoy getting the little glasses and sharing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, our smallest glass size we sell is in a six ounce glass. And sometimes I'll take a sip. I'm like, whoa, this is twice too much. We need half this amount. 
So it's kind of surprising to me, but uh, they're delicious. The sours have kind of gone that way too. Um, and it's very fascinating. And for me, it's very adventurous to see where breweries go next, even though it's not always my cup of tea. Uh, it, it is, and I can't can't wait to see where, where that goes, and we'll be talking about that, I'm sure, in the future. And, Kevin, thanks for your insights as always. Thank you, Jonathan. Joining us here for our conversation, he's a country artist. He even dabbles in acting, cooking, and so much more. He's released a couple singles here recently, Away From You and Down the Line. Welcome in, Cowboy Troy. Hello. I'm good. I'm good. How are you? So far, so good. I appreciate you having me. Appreciate yeah, you absolutely. Me. I feel like you're a busy guy these days. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. I mean, between running around, you know, with music and cooking and all the other stuff that I'm trying to get going and working on uh, promoting my seasoning blend and all that. There's, there's a lot of stuff happening. Well, that, that's perfect. Cause we got a lot of stuff to, to talk about, but this is called bar conversation. So I always got to ask what, what you, what are you drinking? Cause I don't day drink a lot, but I, I grabbed a little Texas whiskey from down in San Antonio, a little Samuel Maverick for our conversation. You got anything good or, or are you behaving yourself right now? As you see next to me, I have redneck Riviera whiskey. So. Ah. There's a little bit there. Yeah, I like it. I like. Now, is whiskey kind of your go-to or, or beer? What What do you? What's your normal drink? Uh, usually, it's Redneck Riviera. Um, you know, depending on the situation, you know, I can consume tequila if if need be, <laughs> wine if need be, or beer. Just depends on the uh, situation. Now, now, are you one of those guys? I, I've talked to to some that'll have a little bit before they go out on stage, or maybe we'll have it with them out on stage. Are you that, that dedicated to the, the redneck Riviera whiskey or, or does that not go with the vocals? Well, I mean, generally tend to have a little bit, uh, you know, before stage it's on my rider. So, you know, <laughs> dedicated like to it. it. I like it. I like it. And, and you also, you know, as much as you enjoy the redneck Riviera, you also help promote it and work with, with John rich on it. And, and what's that like? really cool you know i've been friends with john for 30 years and uh you know help support my buddy's brand and it's really cool and 10 percent of all, all of the uh, sales of redneck riviera whiskey 10 percent goes to folds of honor and they provide scholarships for kids whose parents have been killed in combat so you know we like to do that through folds of honor as well that's, that's pretty awesome because i mean your your relationship with with john goes what back 20 years before he became part of, of big and rich we've been friends 30 years 30 years. Oh, we've been friends 30 years. So, I mean, that's got to be pretty cool to be able to, to help him, him on that. And obviously you enjoy some good whiskey. So it's a win-win. Yeah, it is a win-win. <laughs> now I always ask this too, for folks that are, are whiskey drinkers. Cause for me, whiskey didn't come naturally. Now I greatly enjoy it. Was whiskey something you enjoyed right from the first time you had it? Or did you have to kind of acquire that taste over time? It's an acquired taste, but, you know, with moderation, everything kind of works out and, you know, a little bit at a time you get used to it. I like it. <laughs> I like it. I like that answer. Now, you also enjoy getting into the kitchen a little bit and you got your hip hop kitchen. And what, when did that all get going? It kind of started, uh, you know, when you're on the tour bus, there are times when you have time to stop at a restaurant or through a drive through or a truck stop. And then there are times where you really don't have the opportunity. So you, you, you're in a rush to get to wherever you're going. And, uh, you know, you look in the refrigerator and sometimes you're used to making some things. You have to make some things and improvise based upon what's in the refrigerator. It might be a package of cheese, some chips and some leftover barbecue from, you know, the truck stop before. And sometimes what you have to do is you have to take some of that leftover barbecue if there is any and, chop it up and put it on top of some cheese and chips and you put it in the microwave and you got yourself some barbecue nachos, you know, kind of impromptu. And that was kind of how I got started practicing and getting in the kitchen. And the more I got in the kitchen at home, uh, the better I got with cooking. And then now it's to the point where I think I'm, I, I like to refer to myself as an untrained culinarian uh, in that regard. I'm not quite yet a chef, but uh, <laughs> I, I would say I'm a cook. A decent cook. I'm a pretty good cook. 
I was going to say, I mean, if, if you want to see, check out a, your, your social media, cause you, you share out some of the meals you make and you, you're, you can tell that you, it's not just your typical, Hey, I smoked a little bit of meat. Like you were doing kind of anything and everything. You know, you kind of have to, because when the, when the shutdown happened in 20, everybody was kind of trying to figure out what to cook at home. What do you cook at home? Well, you come come up with some ideas of how to improvise things and put things together and at least make it palatable. I mean, whether you, like the other day I was, I was kind of busy and I didn't have a whole lot of time to go anywhere. So I looked in the freezer and I found uh, some uh, frozen fish fillets and I uh, had a package of frozen mixed vegetables. So I put the frozen fish in the air fryer and then put the mixed vegetables and pan seared them and sauteed them uh, together. And, uh, and then top that over the, the uh, vegetable uh, the, over the fish. And it just worked out into a, a nice looking meal, even though it was all from the freezer and you have to be able to do that. And so I kind of provide that as an opportunity for people to kind of look at ideas, not so much patting myself on the back, like, look at me, I can cook. Hey, no, it's more a matter of like, here's some ideas. If you're looking for something to do and you don't have a whole lot of time or a whole lot of, uh, interest in running straight to the grocery every time you have to prepare a meal. Uh, I, I like that. Cause not everyone has that time. And also not all of us are chefs. Uh, you know, I still have to rely on, on recipes quite, quite a bit and the simpler, the better. <laughs> They're a good guideline. Um, you know, I like to, you know, I like to season my food in layers as I cook, you know, so if I'm, if I'm taking some chicken breast, I'm going to, you know, slice it up and then, you know, put it in the skillet and some avocado oil. I like to season the chicken before I put it in the pan, let it sit for a while so it can absorb the flavors of the seasoning, you know, whichever seasoning blend I use, whether it's garlic, onion, salt, pepper. I've got my own happy half acre uh, all-purpose seasoning blend. I'll let, let it absorb the flavors. Then I'll, you know, put the chicken in the skillet and then I'll season anything else that goes in with the chicken. If you're going to make some, some something like a chicken fricassee, or uh, some sort of other dish, you know, it, you know, chicken marsala. You got to season in layers because sometimes the food, kind of, the seasoning cooks off as you're as you're going along. See, yeah, I've I've been learning about seasoning. I, I I never could put. I apparently never put enough on to begin to begin with, so it was kind of a waste. And then I would let it uh, all cook off. So I'm learning. I'm I'm, I'm getting better. <laughs> season as you go. It'll help you, and you'll you'll have a lot more uh, flavor as you you know as you get towards the tail end and you get ready to eat it. Now, what's your favorite thing to cook or do you have a favorite thing to cook? Well, it depends on the mood. I like to cook pork schnitzel and, uh, you know, I like to cook, uh, you know, a chicken marsala or a chicken Malbec because I don't usually carry, you know, marsala wine here at the house, but if I'm cooking with wine, I'll cook usually with a Malbec. So I'll make a chicken Malbec or a pork Malbec. And you season your, if it's a pork Malbec, you season your uh, pork chops uh, pretty well. And then you, you know, cook it off with that uh, Malbec wine from Argentina. It's pretty good. I like that. I, I, it's funny you say Malbec because my wife and I have just gotten on that. We, in the, uh, a couple of months ago, we were able to go down to Patagonia and, and check things out down there. And boy, do they know how to cook. Although I think all they had is meat and wine. I think that's all that was there. <laughs> meat and wine is good. That's a good option. Meat, wine, and cheese. Yes, yes. Uh, they, they were very good at that uh, as well. It, it was a blast, but I, I, I like that idea. I'm going to have to pass that along to, to my wife uh, as well. And, and you talk about the half, happy half acre uh, all-purpose seasoning. Uh, I'm guessing that's something you created, and the next thing you know, you're like, let's see what we got here? Yeah, you know, sitting around here in the Pounding Woods of East Texas, you have time on your hands sometimes, and you start messing around with different type of uh, blends to figure out what you want to use, what would taste good to use frequently. You know, some seasoning blends you don't want to use every time you cook, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, an all purpose blend would be something that you'd be able to use pretty regularly. So I kind of started messing around with that. And, you know, I bought some different types of blends and kind of figured out what would be a flavor profile to work with. And then I bought some actual individual seasonings and spices and, and things of that nature and bought those individual spices and then started putting them in in a you know formula of my own and found one that suits me and then i said well maybe i ought to market it because i also have a recipe for my own sauce mm. but you know it's easier to carry you know cases and shakers of seasoning around in your luggage than it is to take it to a merch table with jars of sauce you know if the sauce breaks in your luggage you got sauce everywhere you got a little problem <laughs> all over your t-shirts and everything 
you know, if you're selling it, because I sell it at the merch stands too. But, you know, with seasoning, if a shaker of seasoning opens, you know, and you lose one, well, you can take the T-shirts out and you shake them out and, you know, they'll smell great, you know, <laughs> but they won't be drenched in sauce. So, you know, I, I figured that would be the better route at, at the initial stage. So, so the sauce is coming then? Is that, that what I'm hearing? Well, the sauce has been around. The sauce was around longer than the seasoning. I okay. see as a business decision uh, to figure out ways to get the flavor profile and marketing of the brand of Happy Half Acre out in public. And so that's what started after the sauce. Gotcha. Awesome. Awesome. So what, what do you, I'm guessing you enjoy just being creative, whether that's in the kitchen with music, you're just, that's a good outlet for you. It is. It is. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you find yourself, you know, with songs, there are times when song ideas will come to mind. I could be driving, uh, sitting in traffic or, you know, sitting around at the gym, mowing the yard. Sometimes a melody and a song, like a lyric idea will come to mind and, you know, I'll have to stop. And if I'm in traffic, you know, if it's at a stoplight, you know, I'll sit there and I'll hum the uh, melody into my phone and then I'll type up a lyric at the next stoplight. And then, you know, and just kind of keep moving along. And then once I get to where I'm going, I may sit in the parking lot for a bit trying to put at least a rough idea down so that I don't forget it. Because if I don't put it down, I generally forget it. There have been times when I, you know, wake up in the middle of the night and I'll have an idea for a melody or something or a lyric. And if I don't have a way to type it into my phone or write it down or something like that, it's, oh, I'll get it in the morning. It's gone. <laughs> I understand that. I, I've been there many, many, many times uh, on my day job in, in PR and marketing. I'm like, I'll remember that. No, I don't. I never do. <laughs> it's such a great idea. It'll be there. Nope. No. Maybe if you get lucky and someone says something that sparks it, but for the most part, it doesn't. And now, in addition to cooking, I know I also saw on your, your socials that, you know, you, you're you're also working on that green thumb and, and planting some of those vegetables and herbs that you're using. Yeah, you know, it's I like fresh peppers. And, uh, you know, so every year I'll try to go, at least for the last three years, I'll go over to the uh, hardware store and they have like a nursery area out there and you can buy plants and I'll just try to put the proper plants in the proper <laughs> plants. But how, how I feel like that's been a little difficult the way, the way you said that. <laughs> Putting the proper pepper plants in the proper planters is very difficult sometimes, but you know, <laughs> it's easy once you get enough practice at it. I like it. it. The only downside is it's usually what oh, you can only do that a couple times a year, a year. It's not like you get that every day. <laughs> no, no. You just got to make sure you get a, enough rain and, and you, you know, you water them all the time. And sometimes though, the peppers, they kind of tend to get burned in this Texas sun in the summertime. So you got to find some shade for them. But uh, here lately we've had a lot of rain, so it's good that it'll give them a good start. And I've got uh, some strawberries that actually I planted last year. Ooh. And they act, apparently strawberry plants are very hardy because they made it through the winter. And I started harvesting some uh, strawberries and, you know, slicing them up, and putting them on the breakfast cereal. So it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. I like it. I, I I love to see that. Now, are you a spicy guy? Because, you know, peppers come in all, all, all shapes and sizes. Are you super spicy, spicy, or just like a little heat? Here's the way I am. I like to have enough spice to wake up the flavor of my food, but I don't want it to burn my face off. That's fair. I, want to be, I don't want I don't want to be in pain from it. I'm not now in my younger days, you know, in my twenties, I was like, yeah, let's see how hot I can get it. Not anymore. No, <laughs> taste my food. There needs to be enough to wake up the flavor, but not so much that it's overpowering. And, you know, cause some of the peppers, you know, some peppers, if you grow them and then you try to slice them and eat them, they taste like, like a burning kind of a thing, or they smell like something's burning when you eat them, if they're really, really hot. So you have to cook them down and temper that flavor and, and that spice. Just put enough in there to wake up the flavor of your food. You know, it's not a competition. You know, we're, we're not in some sort of, uh, we're not in uh, high school trying to see who can eat the most hot peppers. I like it. That, that that's 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 good advice because I I know some some of my friends are are still still that way. Although I'm I'm like you, I prefer flavor flavor over everything. <laughs> flavor is great. That's why that's why I say flavor in layers because I mean you flavor your meat. It's, here's a prime example. If I'm making ch chicken strips, I will season my meat first, and then I will season the egg white 
I said, I'm going, and I'll season the flour as well. Mm -hmm. That way you have the meat with seasoning, the egg wash, you got more seasoning, and then you got even more seasoning when you bread it. And then you fry it. That way it's not all burnt off in the grease when, it, when, when, you, when you fry it up and you can still taste it. And the longer you let the seasoning sit on the meat, whatever meat, whether it's pork, chicken, or beef, the longer you let it sit there, the more it's going to absorb the flavor, you know, prior to cooking. And it just makes it a lot easier. Are you sure you're not a chef yet? Not a chef. Not a <laughs> chef. I'm not doing any cooking school. During the shutdown, I went over, and I'm living over here in East Texas, and I live about 35 miles northeast of Tyler. And on the yeah. south end of Tyler, there is a restaurant called the Crazy Cajun Kitchen and Market, owned by my buddy Tim. And Tim said, hey, man, you know, you got time on your schedule? Come over here. We need some help cooking. So you know, he's like, I know you're not the cook. I was like, sure. So I go over there and they taught me a lot, lot of things. This is the first time I ever worked in a commercial kitchen. So I learned a lot that way. You know, it's one thing I like to cook for the experience. Mm -hmm. So I take my time when I cook in a commercial kitchen. You're time pressed. So you're trying to make sure everything is done in a good fashion and timely enough for, you know, the person to get their food where it's not cold and they're not sitting for half an hour. And, you know, so there's a lot of line prep that goes with that. And you got a whole lot of stuff that goes in there. But I learned a lot of things working over there. Tim and, and Jake, uh, you know, those guys taught me about making jambalaya from scratch, you know, because. You know, Tim's whole family is from, you know, from Louisiana. They're Cajun, and he grew up in the South Houston area. And, uh, you know, all his folks came from over in Louisiana. So, and then Jake is the head chef over there, the the, the GM, and he taught me about a lot of stuff running the, running the kitchen, too. So, yeah, you learn a lot firsthand, firsthand. I mean, I'm, I can make a good uh, jambalaya. And it's funny because once, you know, you try it the, uh, the old-fashioned way of making it from scratch, you kind of – less likely to want it uh, from the box. Well, like you said, you can control a lot more flavors that way. And there's just something about when you make it yourself from scratch that is, is pretty awesome. Yep, it is fresh. And, you know, I, we've kind of gone down the full list of all the things you've done. And we haven't touched on music. And I, I'm still still not quite there yet because you were in a movie recently, too. You're dabbling in, in some acting. Yeah, uh, Desperate Riders. You know, we got an email from my agent, uh, you know, over at Kincaid Entertainment in Nashville. And they're like, hey, and Julie was like, hey, do you want to take a look at being in this movie? Sure. Send over the script. So I read it. I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to do that movie. And we wound <laughs> up, wound up uh, filming Desperate Riders. It was really cool. And uh, I enjoyed it, you know. And uh, my agent was asking, you know, Julie's like, have you ridden a horse? I said, it's been 25 years since I've been on a horse, since I've ridden a horse. But uh, I was like, why? She's like, well, there, the director wants to know if you'd be willing to ride a mule. And I'm like, I've never ridden a mule, but I'm willing to learn. You know, they got somebody, you know, that's on set, uh, on set that's willing to teach me about riding a mule as compared to riding a horse. At that time, I didn't know there was going to be much difference. I knew a mule is a half horse, half donkey. So, you know. I figured it'd be okay. And I only fell off twice and, uh, you know, no injuries. So I was fortunate with that. And, uh, you know, it worked out. It worked out. Uh, the mule's name is Jackson. And so to make him my friend, I called him Action Jackson. So <laughs> it worked out. But he treated me real nicely and uh, didn't get too crazy, didn't nip at me or bite me or anything like that. It was really cool. Uh, I, I love that. We When we were down in, in Patagonia, we, we did a little horseback riding. And that was probably the first time I, I was on it since I was like a little kid. And I, I didn't get thrown off, but my buddy did because the horse decided it didn't eat. He wasn't holding the reins very well, as we, we learned. And uh, the horse decided it was thirsty, then it was hot, and it went down and he went off. <laughs> yeah, that'll, that'll happen. That'll happen. It was cold where we were at the time. So we were in we were just south of Nashville in Spring Hill, Tennessee, uh, you, know, you know, shooting the scenes that I was in. And uh, it was snow on the ground. So, uh, you know, when you fall off, you're falling in some snow. I was like, okay, that works. <laughs> now, yeah. now, now, did the acting bug bite you? And, and is that something you're also going to look at and try to get into a little bit more? Well, I've done it before. Uh, you know, there was a movie I was in called Furnace. And that was one of those sci-fi thriller kind of scary movies that came out in 07. And I played, a, you know, 
uh, sheriff's deputy in that movie. And then there was another movie I was in called One Heart. And that movie was filmed, but it hadn't been released yet. And it was filmed, you know, back in 2012. But I guess for whatever reason, they couldn't figure out with all the other stuff. And I, I had a small role in that, and it was cool. And I played a, a defensive football coach, you know, played the defensive coordinator for a football high school football team in that film. So, you know, it's pretty, it was a pretty cool experience for that. And, but uh, yeah, I, I enjoy acting, you know, as long as the role is the proper role and, you know, not something that's going to compromise my brand, so to speak. You know, I, I look at the name Cowboy Troy as a brand because it is, you know, I am not the brand, but you know, I represent the brand. So I want to make sure that, uh, you know, anything that I do is not going to compromise that. That make, makes a ton of sense. And and like I said, at the end of the day, kind of what most people probably know you most for is being Cowboy Troy, being on the the the, the music stage. And, you know, you, you've been putting out, out some music, uh, some new music here lately, and I'll talk about that here in a second. But how did you get into music? Is that something that you always enjoyed or, or was it something that just circumstances uh, kind of pushed you that way? Well, I enjoyed music uh, ever since I was a little kid. My folks always had music playing around the house or in the car. And, uh, you know, um, my dad took me to my first concert when I was 13. And once I got there, I was like, you know what? I want to do that. That's what I want to do. And, uh, you know, because at the time I was, you know, considering, you know, when you're in, when you're 13, you know, I was like, I want to do this when I grow up. I want to do that. At 13, I was thinking about wanting to be an engineer of some sort, either electrical engineer uh, or mechanical engineer, something like that, you know, something that was cool, had to do with math. And then the older I got, the more I realized that there was more math involved and more technical math that I was accustomed to and more technical than I was willing to learn. I mean, I learned, uh, you know, calculus is cool and all, but man, you know, after a while, I was <laughs> like, you know what, I don't think I want to be an engineer. But I do enjoy music and, uh, you know, started rapping at parties and stuff in college and DJing frat parties and all that stuff and going to clubs. And, you know, I had friends that were DJs at clubs and DJs outside of clubs and, you know, they were like mobile DJs and whatnot. And they let me perform whenever I had an opportunity, you know, they give me a microphone. I start messing around and the cowboy hat and the jeans and buckle were pretty prevalent. You know, whenever I'd get on stage and it just became one of those things like, you know, the nickname Cowboy Troy stuck. And I got it in college and it stuck. So I've had it ever since. I was going to say, that's not a bad name to get stuck with. No, not at all. Not <laughs> at all. It's not bad at all. And, you know, obviously along the way, I'm guessing, you know, you grew up with a lot of different music, music down in Texas. What were some of those, you know, artists or genres that kind of inspired you along the way? Early on, you know, if I was listening to rock music, it was usually ZZ Top, Def Leppard, uh, Doobie Brothers, you know, just classic rock, what is considered classic rock now. Um, uh, also enjoyed, you know, watching Hee Haw mm. as a kid. And so I spent a lot of weekends watching Hee Haw. And, you know, I thought it was a funny show. And, you know, they had all the skits and all that, but they always had, you know, musicians that come on and play and I enjoyed listening to those, you know, artists and, you know, that kind of stuck with me. And it was years before I realized from watching the Dukes of Hazard that Waylon Jennings was the balladeer telling the story, narrating the story. And I didn't know that until I got older. I was like, oh, wow. You know, because as a kid, you just think that's a cool show. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I watched it for years. And so, you know, it just made perfect sense to me, you know, so you mix in the rock and the country and then. Probably 84, 85, I started listening to rap. 84, I started listening to rap music. Run DMC and LL Cool J and the Beastie Boys and all these, you know, Curtis Blow and all these different rappers. And I started learning their material because it was kind of a cool thing to be able to, you know, be in the lunchroom, you know, you're in school, you know, you bust up with a rap. Oh, that's cool. And I was kind of a quirky kid. I was kind of a nerdy kid. I was an athlete, but I was a nerdy athlete, you know. I was, you know, from, I guess... Oh, probably eighth grade. You know, I started outgrowing my clothes. So sometimes, you know, my clothes would be a little snug and I was getting a little chubby because I ate a lot. And you no, know, I was still an athlete, but I was also, it's like, yeah, 
And then the more I, the older I got, everything was cool though when I could start rapping because people leave you alone. If you could rap, you know, growing up in Dallas, people left you alone. So, you know, they, or they patted you on the back. Either way, you weren't catching any heat from anybody. So, you know, that, that's just kind of your way of moving around, you know, without uh, too much hassle. But it was kind of cool. It was kind of cool, but that was it. Well, and, and like I said at the top, you've got some some new songs out, some new singles. You've got, I think you've released here recently, everything from Gonna Be All Right, Down the Line, and recently Away From You. Um, mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about, about those songs and how those, those three kind of came to be? Sure. Well, a little background. So I'm known for hip hop, you know, which is mixing country and rap and, you know, being the first person with a, you know, an album to be released on a major label that was hip hop start to bottom. The first album was Locomotive. It came out in 2005 and that was on Warner. And so that's the first hip hop record to come out top to bottom, all hip hop music and, you know, on a major label. So I was excited for that. So I've been known for that for all this time. But as I progress throughout my career, when I do solo gigs, you know, people want a little bit more than just hip hop and country rap. So you give them a little rock, a little, you know, classic country and some other stuff. So I look at the progression of my career and my artistry with these new songs. These new songs are just singing. They're country songs. And I tell people I'm not changing what I'm doing. I'm just expanding my repertoire. And those songs are just kind of a a manifestation of that. And they, you know, brought brought that out. And uh, people seem to like those songs. You know, I've I've had people hit me up, you know, on socials and they really like them. There have been people who've texted my phone like, hey, that song is really cool. This song is really cool, whatever the case is. And they really like the new sound. I'm like, okay, well, it's not really, I mean, it's new, yes, but it's not a change or a departure from what I've been doing all these years. I mean, it's, it's just expanding the show so that, you know, instead of doing a, a one hour show, I can add some more. I mean, I do 90 minutes or what have you, but I can add some other things and I can do, you know, a lot more originals and, you know, fewer covers, you know. Well, you can, you can slow, slow things down, down a little bit. It, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, you got to have something for everyone, right? Well, if you don't, you'll only have a few people, you know, whenever I put out a new album, you know, I tell people it's like at least 40 percent of the new record needs to remind people why they liked me in the first place. And then this last 60 percent, you know, you can expand. So I kind of went away from that particular formula on this new project because the new project, six or seven songs, but those songs are all singing. And that's the first time I've ever done that kind of a project. And I wanted to have that project available for people. You know, because there are people in my fan base that want that particular sound. They like the other stuff that I do. They just want that particular sound. So I provide it for them. But yeah, I still I still do that kind of, uh, I still do hiccup. Matter of fact, I did a song with a country rapper by the name of Kill Will. And he and I did this song called Heartland. And the song Heartland actually celebrates the greatness of the American woman. And uh, so it's a, it's a hiccup country rap song that folks are liking too. That came out. Uh, just right before Away From You, a week ahead of Away From You. So it was kind of a, a bit of, you know, people like, well, you got two new songs within a week of each other. Like, yeah, yeah, that's right. Like you said, you're just showing show both sides because like you said, these are definitely different than something if someone remembers I, I played Chicken with the Train. Like you said, this is still you, just a, a different way for you to kind of express yourself. Yeah, well, you know, you have Chicken with the Train is kind of a party song for most people. But if they really listen to and understand the lyric, it's not about partying, really. It's more about, you know, it was at the time people considering bringing hip hop into country mainstream. And they were like, wow, is this going to work at radio? And so the whole, you know, uh, the whole imagery behind the song was, you know, you're looking and you see a light at the end of the tunnel. And is that light, you know, an actual way for me to escape and succeed as an artist, as a hip hop artist, or is it the 515 train coming to meet me head on? And so playing chicken with the train was basically about playing chicken with the music industry and, you know, radio and will they be willing to play it and all that kind of stuff. So that was what that was really about. 
I, I, I love that because I mean the music industry is not it, it is a train and it's coming down the tracks and it doesn't really stop for a whole lot of folks <laughs> no and you know you just have to provide different you know you have to provide different uh, ways for people to enjoy themselves and as an artist you know art is very subjective and you know early on you know I couldn't sing very well I still don't sing all that great I sing okay I think but you know I was known for rapping so you rap for you know, 20, 30 years, you know, you're pretty, pretty good at it after a while. Singing, I didn't pick up singing until probably 10 years ago, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So it's like, it's been, it's been a learning process. I think I do okay. You know, like I say, I'm not, you know, Pavarotti or anybody like that or Michael Buble, but, you know, I'll do the best I can and keep the folks entertained as best as I can do. Uh, well, I, I enjoy the songs. And, and like I said, it's a different side of you. And, you know, obviously you've, you've had a, a good relationship with, with uh, big and rich and, and, and everyone there. What's that been like to kind of have them by your side and kind of be able to kind of, you know, have some success with them and, and, but also have some solo success too. It's been awesome. You know, we've been friends uh, since before the music industry, before anybody had record deals, you know, we've been friends for a long time. I met John in the summer of 93 and then, uh, you know, he introduced me to Big Kenny in the summer of 99 in my first trip to Nashville. So, I mean, it's been pretty cool experience all these years, knowing those guys and being friends with them and hanging out with them and touring with them all this time. And, um, you know, and whenever they do what they're doing, I mean, Kenny's got his own uh, TV show right now that he's been doing. And, uh, you know, he's got his own line of uh, snacks and he's got his own peanuts you know, so that that's going well for him with that. And John, as, as we've talked about previously, you know, he has his own line of whiskey. He's also got, uh, you know, a ready to drink can beverage called Howdy Do. He's got <laughs> barbecue sauce. He's got clothes. He's got, you know, boots. He's got a bar. It's pretty cool. You know, so when you're when your friends succeed, it's awesome. So you have to applaud their success. And, you know, it's cool for me to have an opportunity to do some stuff solo. I enjoy that. But, you know, it's great for me to see my friends doing well and, you know, can celebrate that as well. That's a big deal for me. And, you know, like I said, you, you've kind of been doing all, all sorts of stuff, whether it's cooking, you know, putting the seasoning out, how do you, even acting, uh, you know, a little bit. How do you balance everything? Because that's a lot going on. And, and, uh, and just one of those could take, take a lot of time for somebody. Yeah, well, I tell you, social media by itself is a full-time job. So you add that into being an artist, uh, cooking and trying to put that out and, you know, working in the kitchen, trying to figure out what your seasoning blend is going to be. I came up with a second seasoning blend that's for pork and poultry. I got to figure out when I'm going to get that packaged and out in the marketplace. And there's a lot of stuff that's that's going on, you know, you, you juggle family, you know, responsibilities. So it's it's, you know, you definitely have to manage your time. And, and, and like you said, you, you, you've you got, obviously at the end of the day, I think music is, is kind of your first, first love and true, maybe your true, true love on, on all this. You've been putting out some singles, any more music coming, coming our way? Yeah, I've got a couple more off this project. You know, uh, the project itself is called um, Songs from the Piney Woods, and it reflects the songs that, that I wrote since I've been here in the East Texas area, you know, for the last six years. And, uh, you know, I'm from Texas and just moved back to Texas six years ago from Nashville. So songs from the Piney Woods reflects, you know, the songs that I've written since I've been here and finalized them, kind of taking them from idea to actual song. And, you know, it's a really cool thing. I think your environment influences how you write and, you know, and I, I'm glad that these are here and I'm glad that, people will be able to enjoy them. I'm glad that I've gotten them, you know, recorded because, you know, when you have songs that kind of mean something to you, they start rattling around in your head for a while. And if you don't record them and get them written or put out and released, they tend to kind of bug you, you know, and then for a while, it's like, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night and you're thinking about a song that you've written and, and or you had an idea. And if you haven't finished the idea, it bugs you. You wake up and you got to finish it or sit down and make time to finish it the next day because they kind of tend to, you know, stay with you. There were, there were several songs that have done that over the years uh, with me. And, you know, Dance Floor Romance and Come See Me were songs that came out in 2018. And, 
Well, no, they came out in 2020. I take the back. They came out in 2020. And those songs I had written in 2019, I had had the ideas written in 2019, and I didn't get them done until 2020. But, you know, until they were out, I was always thinking about, I need to get these songs out. I need to get them done. I need to get them finished. They <laughs> sound great. So if you don't do it, it's going to bug you. I mean, at least for me, that is, you know. And, you know, other people have different experiences with art and getting art into the public, you know. But um, for me, it's just a way of expressing myself. And if I don't get them done, you know, they'll tend to distract me for a while. Well, and then, you, then at that point, you're, you're not being able to express yourself. And that's kind of the whole the whole point behind this. And obviously, we're, you know, we're almost halfway through 2023, a couple months in here now. What's what's the rest of 23 look like for you and what can folks expect from you? Well, got some shows coming up this summer. I'm excited about, you know, and, um, you know, I've got, uh, you know, I'll be MC of We Fest again. So We Fest is probably the largest country music festival in North America, out in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. I was the MC for the 39th uh, We Fest last year, and this year is the 40th, and they asked me to come back. So I'm excited about that, and uh, you know that's going to be fun. Got shows, MCing festivals, writing new songs, and putting new music out, and uh, you know wearing Roper clothes. You know, got the Roper clothes on, trying to make sure that I look fresh. The folks at Roper are awesome. You know, I've been working with them for more than 10 years almost 12 13 years and they've been awesome the entire time great folks there and they keep me looking fresh well i was gonna say you're always on the move so you got to be looking good so you can keep being creative and, and folks like i said check out his new music it, it, there's been some great songs it's a little different side side of cowboy troy also check them out on social media you'll be hungry after you do and and, and, uh, and cowboy troy I, I appreciate you sharing a drink and sharing some stories with me Thank you for the time. I appreciate it. Find more from Hops and Spirits at hopspirits.com. Thanks, everybody. Bye.